I don't believe in that stuff. By giving them these very nice, not unique, because there are three of them, Gaussian process summer school umbrellas. Now, you might argue in Sheffield that we should have given them you before. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but you're beholden to use these wherever you are, advertising the summer school. So just to thank uh, okay, Simo, thank you. Uh, Hans and Peter for coming along and giving such a nice talk. Um, I so just a, a quick thank you to all of them. Um, it's got the Latin motto on there as well. <laughs> Very important. Okay, so uh, final uh, session of the workshop and of the um, four-day uh, um, marathon DP event. Um, it's very appropriate it should be CMO. So whereas we've had uh, talks so far from sort of experts coming from the spatial side more, I would say, um, with CMO uh, we're having someone who's going to talk to us uh, coming more, I'd say, from the sort of temporal side, but with a strong interest on extending these temporal uh, methods. And it really follows nicely from Hans's talk, because Hans was starting to introduce common filter modeling and talk about geostats with that. Um, and uh, that's sort of CMO's original background, but I'm not going to say what he's going to talk about, because everyone else has done that. Uh, so over to you, CMO. Okay, thank you, Neil. And thank you for inviting me here. And uh, so. I'm exactly going to talk about uh, like a time series kind of uh, from uh, about Gaussian processes from time series point of view. <laughs> so I, I'm actually going to start with explaining the basic principle of common filter and recursive estimation, and from that I slowly go to the space time thing. I just managed to reach the space time thing, but uh, I hope that I still manage to get give the main ideas in the what you would get if you if you want to go beyond that. Okay, so. Underlying theme is the state space representation, which is related to column filtering. So, I'm actually going to, well, this is um, the introductory part of my book, actually. So, I need to mention that. Uh, it starts from uh, deriving column filtering from a linear regression point of view. So, how you actually derive recursive linear regression. So, I'm going through that. So, we get our first column filter out of that. And then, you can generalize the whole concept and you arrive to so-called Bayesian filtering and smoothing, which is, uh, well, you can generalize all common filters, extended common filters, and sample common filters, particle filters, into like a generic approximations to Bayesian filtering and smoothing equations. And then, how can we actually convert Gaussian process regression models into that form? So we can just use those to solve certain class of Gaussian process regression problems. And then, how to extend the space-time systems well, maybe it would be a temporal spatial system, as you mentioned, but because I'm going from tem temporal to space. But yeah, so, so that, these are actually the interesting things, which I start, just touched. So a lot of force models are very nice when you express them in state space form, and then some other extensions, which you get by borrowing things from the uh, time series methodology. Then a couple of application examples. I will run out of time before that, but anyway, we're going to check one of those examples which seems most interesting. Yes. Okay, so first, how do we go from linear regression to common filtering? So what's the relationship? Well, Gaussian process regression is linear regression, right? You just have a huge number of basis functions, so actually that's one way to think about the connection. But, okay, so let's think about very basic linear regression, regression problem. I, I use notation where this is P as time. I could use like a X and Y, but the, the X is it's pretty sure for other uses in, in this part of the talk because the notation is always problematic. But anyway, we have a linear regression problem. Measurements Y, we have some bias constant, uh, theta 1, and then theta 2 times the independent variable plus some noise. Okay, and uh, if we want to do Bayesian analysis on all this, we need to set up a prior on theta. And then, okay, in probabilistic notation, this means that uh, y given theta, they are conditionally independent or exchangeable. It's, it's Gaussian with given mean and covariance, and then the prior is just a multivariate Gaussian for theta. And this h is defined like this to make it nice matrix form and to get it into common filtering notation. Okay, so we can compute so called batch solution. We just take all the measurements and bang, calculate the solution. That's batch solution in my terminology. So we use the Bayes rule, 
which is basically, well, prior times the likelihood is normalized, which is something like this. And then we can deduce that, okay, these are Gaussian, so the posture will be Gaussian, and we can actually write down the mean, which looks slightly ugly, but it's quite natural, so we have a some kind of prior contribution and, uh, and this kind of term and the variance. So this is what you get if it's just a, well, take gradient and comp compute the maximum and uh, take the second derivative and compute the covariance, for example. Yes, okay, so let's assume that this is given. And now there's another way to approach the same problem. So recursive way. So recursive way means that, because uh, in, in the batch case, what we did is we had a set of data. So we just took all of these and then calculated the well, solution, this parameters. But in recursive thing, what we do is that we start from the first measurement, we calculate some kind of estimates from that, then we post next measurement, we update these parameter values, next measurement, update these, update these, and once we have processed all of these one at a time, we actually obtain a full solution. So that's like a, the recursive solution. Yes, so let's assume that we have posed these measurements already up to here, which is k. So we know the posterior distribution of the parameters given these previous measurements. So it's it's a Gaussian we know for bad solution. So let's say that it has mean m k minus one and covariance p k minus one. And now, okay, what we can we get the next measurement. So now we can use the Bayes rule again. We just uh, treat this previous posterior distribution as the prior, and the new measurement as the only measurement, and we compute the posterior by the Bayes rule. So we can actually write them down. And they will look almost like the like a batch solutions, except that instead of the prior covariances, we have the well previous covariance given the previous measurements. And then, well, this looks the same. We have only one measurement here, and also the prior mean from it's not the prior mean, but given the previous measurements, and the covariance looks almost the same. So if we compare, well, this is this is the same, but we just replace the prior with the like a one step behind conditional distribution or mean and covariance. Okay, but now we can use the magic matrix inversion formula, wood real identity, and we end up into these kind of equations. And in the previous talk we had so-called comma filter equation, and this happened to be exactly the comma filter update equations, which you saw. So what comma filter does in this case is that uh, it solves this linear regression problem in recursive form. So in the end you get the same solution but you're processing the measurements just like uh, one at a time. And it's recursive because it's, uh, it solves the whole problem but in like conditioning on the previous ones, yes. So this is our first comma filter that we will encounter over here. So this solves linear regression problems recursively. And okay, so it's, it's quite interesting. I have too many data points to actually that loop over all of those. So let's say that, so it looks like this. So we, have, I have already processed a couple of measurements on the left. Uh, so my linear regression line looks like this because, well, it didn't look, it, it doesn't have any clear trend in those beginning points. But when I process more measurements like this, now these start to look like a line and uh, so I have very good, well, I'm quite certain about the shape of the function over here, but then the uncertainty goes like this. I just calculated the posterior quantiles of the prediction from the mean and covariance which I, uh, which I got. Okay, so now when we process measurements, we go recursively from left to right, and in the end, okay, we have one measurement left, and now we have the actual batch solution. So it's exactly the same as what we would obtain from the linear regression, just putting all of these measurements to the equation and calculating the solution. Okay, so how we can now extend because we have a recursive rule for computing these. So 
OK, let's, let's first generalize a bit. So what we did, in, in general batch solution, we specify, well, measurement model, saying, for example, that the measurements are conditionally independent. That's typical also in GPU regression. This, that means, this actually means that the noises are conditionally independent to be, or like white. Not conditionally independent, but noises are white, which makes measurements conditionally independent. Is that right? Yes. And then we set up a prior distribution, and we compute a posterior distribution in like a batch sense, because we use all the measurements at the same time, and then we multiply by prior, and then we do <coughs> inference by computing point estimates, moments, predicted quantities, whatever we want to what kind of inf inference we want to do. Okay, this is what we achieved. And, uh, okay, so recursive, recursive estimation, what we do, so we have a measurement likelihood or measurement probability density. I sometimes get, not all people like to, like, this is not the likelihood, actually, it's some, something else, but okay, it's just a term. So then we specify the prior distribution, and we don't just take all the measurements and calculate the solution, but instead we go one at a time. So we always, well, we first we have a prior here before we have, we have seen any measurements. Then we go the first measurement, we condition to that using the Bayes rule. Then we go the next measurement, we condition on that, given the previous one as the prior. And so we pr process recursively like that. And in the end, we get the same solution as from the batch case but we are processing in certain order. Well, of course, the order doesn't matter, but anyway, the point is to process one at a time. Okay, so now we can generalize a bit. So, uh, because, well, we can now think that these are actually some kind of time series. So I, I don't need to assume that this, I have a constant parameter here. So for example, these linear regression parameters. But I can also think that, uh, for some reason, between these measurement steps, it changes somehow. So I can also think that, okay, first, when I on when I'm working marker, I have theta 1 and theta 2, and then it drifts a, drifts a bit to some direction, and then we measure the next one, and then it drifts again a bit to some direction, theta 1, theta 2, so, it's, if I call this direction time, then this is like a time varying linear regression problem. And uh, the common filtering way to model that is so that we, okay, the measurement model is still the same. And we set up a Markovian process prior on these parameters. So this is a random walk prior, which is the, do I have a, in other notation, no, I don't have it. But anyway, this is that the theta k is equal to previous theta k minus one plus Gaussian noise. And this is the prior. And uh, now we can actually, because we started from the recursive formulation, almost the same thing works. We just add some additional prediction step in which we still get the like full Bayesian solution by using the same kind of philosophy or recursive estimation. So we can actually derive it. So again, I assume that we have processed these measurements up to some, well, k minus one. So our parameters at the same time instant have been conditioned on the previous measurements. And it's Gaussian with certain mean and covariance. And now we can use, this is sometimes, well, we can, from the joint distribution of this and this, it's actually, well, originally I have a theta k given theta k minus one given the measurements. But now I'm assuming that this is Markovian, so the measurements drop out from here. So I can actually write down this joint distribution in terms of my model and the posterior from the previous step. Okay, then I integrate over theta k minus one. This is also called chapman kolmogorov curve equation. So I get prior for the next step given the previous measurements. And now I can use the Bayes, no, I do use Bayes rule yet, but if I write this down, so in Gaussian case, actually this amounts to just predicting, well, in, in my random walk model case, this corresponds to just up, so that the mean remains the same because 
the dynamic model doesn't change the well it was random walk model so it, on average we have the same level and the covariance is that we get slightly more uncertain in our estimates because this randomly wanders in space okay so that's that's called prediction step by the way in, in common filter and so now we can use the Bayes rule to update the posterior distribution of this parameter at that particle time point of course these parameters are now changing in time according to my random walk model here so again well these are the same equations as before so this is the common filter update step again so these equations together with <coughs> these equations give the basic solution to estimating this time varying linear regression and this is this is again one special case of so-called common filter and okay so so you could imagine how you would approach the batch version of that okay so we actually discussed about time varying uh, linear regression so it's possible to well if you have one dimension run well you can calculate the covariance function of that and then the covariance function of that will be the of the joint process will be like a tensor product of this this and the time case but anyway it will be a huge Gaussian process regression problem so if I have a 100,000 time points I need to invert 100 time thousand times two times or squared gram matrix in the GP regression but in this case I just need to well, iterate these equations well for 100,000 steps and these are actually two times two matrices so it's quite simple okay but let's continue yes so would you um, would you not get stability problems you have to use some square root uh, updates here or would it, is it all right well, in this case, for sure not, because uh, the, this is actually, so I, I'm, I'm slightly lying about, uh, so the, <laughs> the, the, this, is, this can be seen as the Gauss-Newton algorithm for solving the gauss process equations by using the sparsity of the inverse covariance, it's equivalent to that. But actually, you, you don't get numerical problems if you don't get them in the original problem. Yes, so, so, yes, so this actually, if you first write down the Gaussian process regression problem for this, and then form the tensor product covariance function, and then you write down the algorithm to calculate the whole thing down, and then you reformulate the problem as in terms of the inverse covariance, and optimize that calculation, you end up into this. Roughly, but it only works when you have those uh, Markovian things. That's the key thing. Because otherwise, you don't get the sparse yes. inverse structure. Yes, indeed. Okay, but uh, I don't have any nice. So I, I don't know how to visualize this kind of time varying linear regression. But if I apply it to some sinusoidal, I can like think that I have local linear regressions going on here but this is not the way you would really do if you wanted to track the sinusoid also that's the thing but in principle you, you could do like a local linear regression like that okay so now slight notational change I, I use this theta for parameters which is often used in some Bayesian analysis books at least so so I had a, like a Markovian model for theta case and then measurements were given the theta. But actually in common filter in our well, control theory we usually, usually use x for the same kind of parameter and it's called state. So the state contains in this case the linear regression coefficients. So they are the unknown parameters that we estimate. Now, now we have a slight controversy on what's parameter and not but okay let's not worry about that. And so in, in more standard state space notation, you would see this in this form. So we have a model for x case in time. So x k given x k versus 1 is some Gaussian run work model. And the measurements are y case given x case. 
Actually, Neil was already, already using this notation in his talk, so. But just in case so that it, it's easy to mix these x's to the inputs and so on. Yeah, so actually, this is the form where you usually see this random walk model. Yes. Okay, but so we can easily generalize. So, in general, probably the state space model, we, we have some kind of Markovian model. We don't need to have a uh, that uh, run Gaussian random walk model, but we can have a lot, like a very complicated model. Say, in 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 tracking, you might have a derive a stochastic model for car movement based on the physical constraints, and then you put some kind of Gaussian process inside there, and you will end up with the Markovian model by construction. Or you might have a in ensemble comma filtering, you might have a like climate prediction model, which will look like this. So given the previous one, you can like predict the next one so that the, the information doesn't flow from the previous ones, but the previous weather defines the next one. Well, the, or the previous weather, maybe the velocities need to be included in the state, but that's like a state is defined by, so that it's all the variables that are needed to predict the future. Okay, and the measurement models look like this. So we have some density or measure of measurements given the states. It's very innocent looking model, but it includes a lot of models. Of course, any state, any basic model can be written in, in this form, and you have only one time step, right? And uh, this can be seen as, th these are sometimes called hidden Markov models. There's a slight terminology glitch because I think that the Markov models sometimes mean the discrete state models, which you see in uh, speech processing, but actually, well, so this is a bad word, actually. <laughs> let's, let's say that these are probabilistic state space models instead. Okay, so if we forget about the linear regression now and think of another example, which is more common in, in common filtering when you <laughs> In, well, let's say in introducing common filtering. So let's think about Gaussian random walk model, which is we have a state. So now we express the thing in terms of time series. So we have this kind of. So this is just a random walk in one dimension. I should actually have a picture of that, but let's, just in case I'll draw it over here as well. Yes, yeah, so. So the next time point is always, uh, or next signal or state is always the previous one plus some Gaussian noise. So there's a like random steps going on. That's why it's random walk. And we measure the state of the random walk plus some Gaussian noise. Of course, this is just a state space model of a form. It defines a Gaussian random walk, which is this is a Gaussian distribution with mean x k minus one and the variance q, and this is a Gaussian measurement model, of which can be written like this. And what it looks like is this, so we have a random walk going on in here, and we measure something out from here. You can now see some resemblance maybe to Gaussian Bros regression, so in Gaussian Bros regression you also have this kind of plot, and then you have measurements, and then you want to estimate the thing inside. And uh, in common filter, you also have measurements and what to estimate the thing inside. So maybe it's the same thing. <coughs> yes, okay, so what kind of state space model we typically have? In linear Gauss Markov model, it's the generic uh, common filtering model, if you prefer that term. I don't. It's a linear state space model where we have a matrix, it's, it's a linear function of the previous states plus some Gaussian noise, and the measurement model is uh, for linear transformation of the current state plus noise. Of course, this random work model was linear Gaussian model, but we can have very generic classes of other models. And uh, when you have this kind of system, then x, k will be a discrete time Gaussian process, and y, k will be a discrete time Gaussian process. And uh, then you might have non-linear models, 
which are non-Gaussian processes, so that goes beyond Gaussian processes already. So if you have non-linear functions over here. So typical models are, well, you might have a car movement model, as I said. So if you parameterize the uh, wheel turning of the driver, then it's a non-linear function from the wheel turning to where the car actually goes. So if you can model that wheel turning as a Gaussian process actually inside and you en encounter a non-linear model. And you might have a radar which measures the position of the car. And radar measures like range and uh, direction. And direction, it's a, like arcus tangent of the position, so it's a non-linear function. And range is the square root of like a x squared plus y squared minus the sensor positions. Okay, and then we might not have discrete type systems, but it's also possible to... So we might have a continuous signal, and we just measure it at some discrete times. And now that's close to Gaussian process regression, because in Gaussian process regression we have a random functions, well, which these x like they are, and then we measure those at discrete time instances, if we want to think it in terms of filtering or state space models. Yes, so this is a generic model class. And, okay, so what are the filtering and prediction and smoothing terms then? So that's what you usually encounter. In principle, given this kind of state space model, we can actually write down the whole uh, posterior distribution in, in principle. But the problem is that when you have very many time points, this will become, it, it's, it's, not, it's infeasible to actually cope with this. And there's another problem is that usually we get measurements sequentially one at a time. And uh, if we use this Bayes rule, always when we get another measurements, we would need to start the whole estimation from start, from the beginning. And new measurements we need to run all over. So that's why we want to use recursive estimation. I know I already mentioned that we are, common filtering and filtering are about recursive estimation. So we update the estimate that we, or posterior distribution that we already have. So you could say, like modifying Bellman's argument a bit, I don't know what it would be, like curse of computational complexity with... Yeah, so typically it's number of time points power to three, because you usually invert the matrix. So that's the reason why we actually concentrate on this kind of distributions, because actually we are not explicitly interested in the joint distribution of these. But instead, okay, if we think that this, would, this was the Gaussian process regression solution or problem, so we would like to actually predict the value, example, over here. So we are just fine to, if we know the marginal distribution of this particular time point, or this particular time point, we are not really interested on the correlation or joint distribution of the whole thing. Okay, if we are, we need to extend this, but anyway, in this, we actually concentrate on solving these marginal distributions. And for historical reasons and for, well, computational reasons, these are the ones. So, so filtering distributions are the ones which I use to demonstrate the common filtering. So filtering distributions are so that uh, if we are over here, we are conditioning on the previous measurements only. So it's a posterior distribution of this, this time step given the previous measurements. So it's kind of common, well not common, but causal estimate. And that's why it's called filter. Well, the history of the filter word is, word is okay, if you have a, well, this kind of signal, we observe something. You can think that you have a, clean si signal inside, right, which is a random walk. And then you measure some measurements which contain noise. And when you, like, estimate this based on the previous measurements, you kind of filter out the noise, right? That's the reason why it's called filter originally. But yeah, so that's just a historical term. But then you can also calculate predict prediction distributions, which are, so, given that you have measured these measurements, you calculate the distribution of this, or this one, something in the future. And smoothing distributions, 
well, they are just marginals of the batch solution, actually. So given that we have observed all of these measurements, what is the postural distribution of this time point? That's the smoothing distribution. Yes. And feel free to ask questions at any, at any point. How does the filtering differ from smoothing again? Filtering. Uh, filtering only you condition on the measurements up to the current time point. So this is 1 to k when this is k. Uh, whereas in smoothing you have observed from 1 to t and then you estimate you want to know something in the middle given all the measurements. So it, the smoothing is like the batch solution. Oh, right. So it looks like one special case. Uh, well, this is a special case of this, yes. But for historical reasons, they are divided into these two. Because in times, so you have a natural ordering. So it makes sense to do that. But in spatial yes. things, it's, it's just looking at part of your data and there's no natural order. Yes, it's true. Sometimes these are uh, illustrated like this. So filtering is uh, conditioned on the measurements up to current time point, and in smoothing you condition on all the measurements and estimate that one. In prediction, okay, you have measurements only from here, and you estimate the current step here. Okay, so we can now generalize. So what are the whole equations? How you can actually solve all of these problems in principle? So, okay, so. In filtering, we are interested in computing, well, as I mentioned, the distribution of this point given the measurements up to that time. So xk given measurements 1 to k. And the main idea is, so what we have been given is that uh, we have uh, the prior distribution, which is kind of like a time zero distribution, if we think in terms of recursive estimation. And then we have a state space model given, which is the Markovian model for x and uh, and measurement for the wise. And then we have the measurement sequence, which we, it has natural ordering from 1 to k. Actually, th this defines the ordering. And uh, then the filter is actually a recursive rule for, if we know the previous filtering distribution, we update it into next filtering distribution. So that's, that's called optimal filter or Bayesian filter, those equations. And we can actually write them down, it's quite easy to derive them. So we start from the prior distribution, just before the first measurement. Then we, well, on the first step, we actually put uh, the prior here. So we compute the prediction, which means that it's the distribution of the next time step given the previous measurements. It's chapman kolmogor equation, which can be written down like this. And in Gaussian case, you get mean equation and covariance equation, which are the Kalman filter prediction equations. I didn't write them down, but you can look them up from Wikipedia or somewhere. They, are, they just implement this. And then you have the Bayes rule at these measurements, so, so you condition on the <coughs> predicted distribution to current measurement. And you run that recursion, and that's, that's the filtering solution. It computes the posterior distributions of each step recursively forward in time. And in parameter estimation, you're very interested in this particular term here, but okay, it's just a normalization constant over here. Okay, you can sometimes visualize this like this because you think that you have a prediction step with some Kolmogor equation and an update step. So you have a dynamics which move the previous distribution somehow, then you end up having a prior likelihood, and then you fuse them to get the posterior distribution. So, so this is the extra step to like batch or no, the normal like Bayesian estimation when you think it in terms of one step. Okay, so carbon filter is the generic solution to linear Gaussian models. So it's a, we have just mean and covariance because uh, in linear Gaussian case the posterior distributions are Gaussian. So you can write the whole thing down in closed form. And then there are so-called extended comma filters when you have no linearities in the model. So what you, well, an engineering way to go is to linearize them. So you form like a Taylor series expansion of both the functions. And then you end up having a linear state space model, and then you apply the comma filter, basically. 
that's the extended comma filter. They are more co complicated versions, but anyway, the basic idea is always that. And then you can use so-called unsented comma filters. Well, you you actually, what you are interested in, you have a dynamic system, and you can think that you you have a distribution here, and you like a transform that distribution through the dynamics into another. And then on the updates that you also like a, think that you are transform distributions such that you estimate the mean and covariance. That's called unsented transform. It has a fancy name, but blame Simon Julia about that. But uh, it's in a way, it's a bit different approximation than Taylor series. It uses sigma points to approximate the nonlinear filter which forms Gaussian approximations. And then there are, you can, use a, you can formulate the generic problem as numerical integration, which is used for moment matching of the Gaussian distributions. So you get all kinds of Gauss Hermite and Cupertin comma filters where this prefix refers to the particular numerical integration methods used. <coughs> and well, ensemble comma filter is related as well. There you basically use, uh, for the prediction step, you use the number of Monte Carlo samples instead of these Taylor series or unscented or Gauss Hermite rules. Well, that's one way of seeing that. So it's, it anyway targets to the Gaussian approximation to the posterior distributions. The, the correct thing, I mean, my outsider's view is that the ensemble uh, common filter is the stochastic version of the unscented common filter. Well, you, you can see it that way, yes. But there's a... Uh, I, I don't, I'm not too familiar with the recent versions, but at, at least there are some heuristics inside. For in an outsider, it's fine. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so the, 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 there are some heuristics which are not present, present in unsented comma filter, which are in ensemble comma filter. There's that, uh, well, you need to ask Hans about that. It's the localization things are not in unsented comma filter, for example. Okay, but then there are particle filters which don't try to form the Gaussian approximation at all, but they try to approximate the whole distribution. Of course, in here, my linear regression was a linear problem, so I was fine with mean and covariance. But if I didn't have a linear measurement model, then my posterior distribution at its step wouldn't be Gaussian, and I would like to use, say, Monte Carlo approximation for that. And so that's where the particle filters can be used. So they use Monte Carlo representation, and they form it using sequential Monte Carlo sampling. And then you can, of course, calculate everything in grid. So these are the distributions. If you have one dimensional case, you can just uh, form a long vector which corresponds to the densities, and that's possible as well. And then there are all kinds of combinations of particle filters and common filters and, and these. So you get like mixed Gaussian approximations. Okay, and so what common filter looks like? This is the random walk model. I, I chose to use small number enough measurements so that I can actually run down the whole animation here. So this is the mean of the common filter, and also the like a 95 person quantiles if you wish to, well some co constant times the standard deviation kind of uh, confidence interval. So. Yes, so basically it starts, and this is now going backwards, but we start from the prior distribution, okay, I have it plotted that, but we cross the first measurement, actually the common filter result doesn't exist between the measurements in this formulation, but this is that when you plot the math up, you always use the lines to <laughs> connect the dots, right? So these are the estimates which we get, these are the basic solutions to the estimation problem of like uh, conditioning on the previous measurements and its time step. Yes. Okay, but this is conditioned on the previous time steps only, so that's not what we want. We want to condi condition to all the data. So that's called basic smoothing problem. And the terminology is unfortunate because smoothing means all kinds of other things, as filtering means other things as well, but let's not worry about that. So we have this state space model. Well, the same as before. Okay, I switched the order, but that's just not <laughs> the point here. And, and as you would, we already have computed the filtering distributions. Then 
we actually want to compute the smoothing distributions which well they are conditions on all the data and we want like all the intermediate steps or the posterior distributions for those so we're interested in that and we actually want to recurse the equations again so that they are like a linear intern like constant number of computations per time step and uh, so it turns out that we need to have a backward recursion because well as, as you mentioned that the filtering is actually a special case of smoothing and the special case they are identical when we have processed all the measurements so the smoothing distribution of the last time step is the same as this the filtering, filtering and smoothing distributions co coincide the size there so we will have a backward recursion and we can also derive that and it looks like this so, so this is just the filter prediction equation actually so it's just by Tatma Kolmorgo and then we have a fairly simple equation which is the backward recursion and again in Gaussian case all this reduces to well some kind of backward recursion for the mean and covariance so they are fairly simple backward matrix equations so they now compute the marginals of the full solution the problem and yes so that's uh, you sometimes call this Kalman smoother but the pro more proper name is Rosten Strebel smoother which is the closed form solution to the uh, linear Gaussian case and uh, then there are you can derive Taylor series or unscented or all kinds of approximations by using the same approaches as in filtering so you encounter the, the, the corresponding smoothers and uh, then also these numerical integration smoothers and particle smoothers exist so you use, use sequential Monte Carlo for them and and Walbach for smoothers and so on in principle so this is very analogous to the filtering case except that you process backwards on that one sweep yes so what it looks like in this case so this is a common filtering solution so the smoothing can be thought of it starts from the beginning and you it's a backward sweep which conditions on the already seen measurements like that so that's the smoothing solution so that's the conditional marginals given all the measurements for each time point yes so we are quite close to Gaussian post regression already are the, has, the, has the, uh, window of uncertainty shrunk in the middle of the data there? You wouldn't you expect it to, to be, be slightly more uncertain at the ends of your data? Uh, well... Say you expect it to shrink a bit. Why doesn't it? Well, it, it might be due to my choices of prior and uh, I, I do have data point in the end. So it, it might like a... Right. You, you might have a larger quantiles in the end and right. beginning, but I haven't plotted it though, <laughs> that's the thing. Yes, okay, so what we can now do is that, okay, we had a discrete time random walk, which is defined only at the discrete time steps. But we can also think that actually, yes, we, we have some, like, it's actually a function of xt, and we, just, we actually have a continuous process, and we just measure it at some time instance. And uh, we can do Neil's limiting procedure, which you actually used in the. So you, you can think that you actually add like number of points between the measurements. So you actually have like an iteration of the. So you stack many measurements or many states, many time points that you measure, many time points measure. So what you encounter is that, well, this is a difference equation. So when the delta t goes to zero, you would expect what you get from difference equations. When you take delta t goes to zero, you get difference equations, right? So your random walk model actually, well, we look, it, what we get is that this is the original one, or this is the original one. We just have the MATLAB linear interpolation between the points. Then we add some intermediate points there, and eventually, if I took this to limit, we would get a continuous process. And in mathematical sense, actually what we get is that we get continuous random walk model like this. So it's a difference of equation for xt, and this is a white noise process here. And this continuous process 
is sometimes called a Brownian motion or Wiener process actually with certain parametrization. So if we take the continuous limit of the discrete time random walk, we get Brownian motion model. And now, if I think what we actually have, so we have a Brownian motion model for x, t, and we measure it at discrete time steps or some prices. So we have a Gaussian process regression problem, right? So we can also write it down so x, t has a prior, well, this was the Brownian motion covariance function, and we measure it at discrete time steps. And now, okay, but we can solve this with Kalman filtering. And it actually hap happens that uh, if you run Kalman filtering for this model, we get this Gaussian process regression solution. Ah, okay, here. Yes, actually, this was the spectral density of the white noise and uh, hence the Brownian motion. So it's not. We know process is a Brownian motion with Q is 1. It's, yes, it's not. Well, it's the same pr parameter, yes. Okay. But what that uh, filtering looks like is that it's defined actually for each time instant. So we don't just uh, come up filter at at the measurements, but we, our filtering distribution also exists at each time step. So when we condition only on the previous measurement, it looks like this. So we condition on the measurement, it jumps, or like a, the uncertainty go, becomes lower, and then uncertainty grows until next measurement, and so we get this kind of solution. And now we can run the smoother to this. Why isn't it zero at zero? Oh, you had an initial state as well. Uh, so I had a, this is the prior. I, I, it seems that I had, maybe this is a 1.96 <laughs> over here, <laughs> so it was like a unity variant. <laughs> yes, so we can run the smoother and it's also defined at its, its time instant between the measurements. The smoother mean seems to be the same as the filter mean. It's not the same. The, this red one is the filter mean. So on, the, on your previous one, though, it seemed to just overwrite the filter mean. Uh, <coughs> no, this is... Uh, I might have a mark in my code if that's the case. It's completely possible. <laughs> It may be an Yes, or it, it was actually the filtering thing. But it, it shouldn't be the same. It, it should be different. But yes, so the smoothing solution will look like this. It looks smoother with that term. And actually, so this will, this is exactly the Gaussian board regression solution that we would obtain if we use that Brownian motion prior. OK, so we can generalize this a lot this filtering thing, so we have a continuous discrete problems and actually you can write down the formal solution to fool all kinds of things, at least in principle. But you need to solve a part of the differential equation. In practice, you approximate with the Gaussian, so you have a differential equation for mean and covariance. But anyway, the solution exists. And you can also derive quite generic uh, smoothing solutions. Oh, okay, this is still filtering solutions. So this is a common filtering case. But for the smoothers, you can also derive uh, continuous discrete versions, which is the for using uh, used for continuous time and discrete measurements problems. So you can actually derive those. But okay, let's try to generalize that state space thing, which we already had, or that or that the Brownian motion thing, the state space models. Okay, so first, slight notational change. That's always a problem. That notation, because uh, in the Gaussian proof regression you have fx, where x is not a state, it's the input or a spatial variable. And okay, we can define Gaussian process as a, it's a process with where all these finite dimensional distributions are actually Gaussian. And be aware of the notation. And we can define the Gaussian process in terms of mean and covariance functions, and this will be the notation here. And uh, so this property just means that we always have a Gaussian joint distribution for this. And uh, so in Gaussian regression, we are not dealing with 
time series as we did, but instead we use no, there are non-parametric buyer models for learning mappings. And we have noisy samples, well, measurements or whatever you call them. And then we want to estimate the values or interpolate is one term used for values. And we can also define a temporal Gaussian process is a random function of t, which will be, the, by the way, very close to what you have. And then we, our regressor functions all, are actually only one dimensional. I will all, uh, concentrate on those. So y of ft and the mean and covariance are of this form. OK. So what I'm going to claim is that, uh, well, extrapolating from the Brownian motion case, that let's say that we have this form of Gaussian product regression problem. So now my independent variable is t, as I had in the linear regression case. So let's say that I have, for example, this kind of covariance function, which is, I always almost used the wrong term, <laughs> exponent d quadratic, yes, not squared exponential. <laughs> because it's not squared exponential. <laughs> Yes, so I'm claiming that actually, given this kind of problem, you can, in quite general conditions, form a state space model of this form so that this common folder and smoother computes the GB regression solution exactly. I just need to figure out what these A and L and H matrices actually are. And, okay, and the reason to do that is that if I solve the GB regression solution with T measurements, I have a T power 3 complexity, right? But common filter, it's just a linear pass and smoother is linear pass. So it's actually OT, so it's linear in the number of measurements. It's very beneficial in computational sense to do that. Okay, so. Okay, so, so what does Gaussian process regression? Of course, I can process measurements one at a time with Gaussian process regression. By the way, the colors don't show very well. It is so at all. <laughs> well, you can. Can you see? Yeah, I can. On that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you can just see those those quantiles are quite hard to see. Well, it's. Do you think that it's easier to see? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's maybe, maybe you can see it, so I can continue anyway. Okay, so the key thing is uh, a different representation of Gaussian processes. Why is that? <laughs> okay, so, so you can represent Gaussian processes in different ways. So one way is co covariance function, which is the way which you use in, in G pi, for example. Another way is the Fourier transform of the well, stationary covariance function to get the spectral density the spectral domain. And then another one is uh, to think about sample functions or the path space. And uh, at least how I think about it is that uh, the sample functions somehow correspond to the difference or equation representation of the Gaussian process. So for example, my Brownian motion, it was a difference or equation. So that's the path space representation of the Gaussian process. But of course, given uh, this, it's a Gaussian process, I can also compute its mean and covariance functions. So this particular Gaussian process happens to have the zero mean and this kind of covariance function. So this is called ersten uhlenbeck covariance function. Well, because this equation is ersten uhlenbeck equation, so it gains its name from this, uh, this differential equation, actually. OK, and uh, I can also compute the corresponding spectral density. So this process has this spectral density. And uh, now I can actually, this is of the form, if I use this this as the dynamic model of my comma filter. I, I can actually use comma filter as smoother to do the estimation. And the thing is, the key thing is that this FT is Markovian. It's Markovian because it's a solution to this white noise, white noise through a differential equation. It's difficult to see it from here. I, ca I can see it from here, but you can't. can't. I, I can see actually it, it will be first order Markovian. It's because this is a second order polynomial. <laughs> 
OK, but we can actually generalize. So this is a differential equation. But let's say that we have this kind of differential equation instead. So it's a nth order with white, white noise input. So not, now actually, this is also related to state space models, because we can, I can just stack the time derivatives from here to a vector. Uh, well, I have it. OK, this is the vector. And then I can write it down as a first order differential equation. So that actually fits to my comma filtering model, because this is the derivative of f, which used to be x is equal to a times the state plus noise, or L times noise. Yes, OK, so that corresponds to the state space model. But now I can also use another way to solve this, is by taking the Fourier transform. And then I can solve this spectral density. OK, so it's so this f will be Markovian polars, but let's continue. So if I solve the spectral density by elementary methods, it happens that uh, this LTI SDEs, which correspond to state space models, as I showed, always have this form. So it's constant divided by polynomial squared. And uh, so if I have uh, this form of spectral density, I can form the state space model, which has this spectral density and the corresponding chorus function. So I'm actually quite lucky, because the so matter class happens to have uh, this form. Well, actually, the reason is that because matter class was based on differential equation originally, so it's <laughs> it's just the reason. But I can also approximate. So actually, this doesn't have a rational form, but I can approximate it quite easily. OK, so I'm going to skim through very, very, very quickly. But anyway, if you have a covariance function or spectral density function, there exists a lot of like uh, methods from control theory that you can use for forming the corresponding state space model out from that. And uh, they are called spectral factorization methods. The so principle, just in case you have heard about this. So you talk about this transfer function. So you, you actually factor this spectral density into causal part and non-causal part. And then you can use the spectral factorization methods to determine this g. And then you, well, you in practice, you compute the roots of this denominator, or actually denominator and denominator of that. A numerator, and then you take the like a in Laplace domain you have like a, like a left half plane roots and the right half plane roots. You might have heard something about that. So you take the causal part of that in Fourier domain. They are upper and lower half plane, and then you take the inverse Fourier transform and that, and finally you will get the state space model out of that. It's slightly complicated, but it's straightforward. It's in control systems toolbox, for example. So you can use even that. OK, so in practice, so if you want to convert a given covariance function to state space form, so what you can do is that, uh, well, you first take the, this covariance function, say, <laughs> exponent is quadratic. It's actually <laughs> need to like, take a breath and think what you say. Uh, yes, so you compute the spectral density by taking the Fourier transform. I don't the FFT, mean FFT, but really compute the Fourier transform. You can actually use tables of Fourier transforms, so you don't need to worry about that. And if this is a not, not a rational function, then you need to approximate it using like Taylor series or party approximants. There exist a lot of methods to do that. And then you do that uh, spectral factorization, which I mentioned before. You, so you form this G. It will be a complex valued rational function, actually. And then you use those methods from control theory to form the state space model, which consists of the A matrix, L matrix, and H matrix. So, no, this kernel has to be stationary. Yes, that's a restriction, because otherwise the spectral density doesn't exist. But uh, luckily, control theory is quite developed, though already this is from like 50s and 60s, so already in 70s they had solutions to non-stationary case, but they are quite complicated and not there yet. But yeah, so. What we have is that given this kind of Gaussian regression problem, we can relabel this as time, and then we can convert it in, this, in state space form by using the method before. And then we can use the common filters and smoothers to do the estimation. So the smoother solution will be the Gaussian process regression solution, and I'm running out of time, so that's why I'm trying to <laughs> hurry up a bit. Yes, and this should be t, and this would be t square t the third to be consistent with the notation, but anyway, you gain very much in computations. And what this look like, so for example, 1D matter family 
it looks simple, there's only one basal function and a couple of constants, but anyway, if you take nu is 3 over 2, you will get third or three dimensional state space differential equation like this. So if you run a common filter using this dynamic model, you will get the GP regression solution for that. So to summarize, in conversion with GP regression, you evaluate the covariance function and compute the mean and covariance of the formulas and then use the mean for prediction. Over here, in state space form, you first form the state space model, then you run a comma filter forward, and then the smoother backward, and then you use the smoother result as the prediction. You need to use the continuous version of the smoother to get the solution at every time step. Or if you are fine with finite time steps as you usually are, you can use the discretized version. And you can, well, GP regression, I'm also referring to my own book <laughs> without any shame. And uh, you can use parameter estimation methods from the state-based context. And so this is actually similar to my Brownian motion, but this is the Matern uh, 3 over, oh, actually 5 over 2. So this is the common filtering solution, and this is the smoothing solution. And the purpose of this was to demonstrate that actually the TV regression solution, which I demonstrated before, is really exactly the same as this smoother solution. Of course, because they are equivalent, just different formulation. Okay, so interesting things to look which based on these kind of ideas. So we can actually go to space-time systems as well. So I thought today I'm only able to sketch the idea but you can think of space-time process as a but you have a one-dimensional process first and then you add a couple of dimensions, say 10 and then you add even more and it, you end up continuum of vector components so that's the state space, st space-time process so you have like a functions running in space and still common filtering works in the sense that, uh, okay, let's say that we have a space-time GP regression problem of this form then there exists the corresponding state space model of this form. So we don't have matrices over here, but these are operators. But anyway, it's uh, like a space-time process defined by a differential equation. And you can use like infinite times versions of common filter and RDS motors, which still scale literally in time and dimension. So in practice, you need to use partial differential equation methods to approximate these operators and you actually end up using finite dimensional like comma filters and smoothers. But anyway, it, it has linear time scaling still. And uh, now this function Hilbert space value process, if you want to say, is Markovian process. Okay, so what they look like, this is the matter and covariance function and we will have this kind of stochastic partial differential equation which sounds scary, but it's possible to deal with numerically still and there are pseudo difference operators here and all kinds of funny funny things yes and you can also combine these with with latin force models so you have a if you have a like a first principle model say of this of different equation form and there's latin force which you want to model using a gp which is neil's idea and uh so we can now formulate this as a state space kind of system as well. So we measure at the discrete time instance and uh, let's say that we have we model this process as a say matter and time GP model. So in the Latin force concept I, I, you used, it, it's possible to actually like in many cases to calculate the corresponding covariance function for the whole thing and use the GP regression solution which is very generic yes but it's also possible to in when you can do this state space conversion is that you actually can form a corresponding differential equation which generates this process and then you just stack these processes like this and you notice that uh, you just obtain a nonlinear common filtering problem and now you can use nonlinear common filters or particle filters if you prefer to actually do inference on this resulting model and you have linear time scaling still yes so as I mean Okay, and extensions, okay, you can borrow methods from the comma filtering context, so they have solved some problems of which some are not solved in GP regression. For example, like change point detection is one, and you, you can have a 
you can come up part of the differential equations. And well, student T thinks also in GP regressions is fine. But there are some online parameter estimation methods. And okay, so if you want to go to classification, you can do it. And uh, nonlinear models, well, actually, in n sub comma filter, you have nonlinear models, but you can use extended comma filters for that. Okay, and as I guessed, I don't have time for applications, so let's read the title. So, one later, later for, <laughs> or the, well, let's say that, that read the titles and very brief explanation of what's going on there. So, one application has been like a GPS satellite orbit prediction. So, you have actually non linear model for the orbit, and then there are some unknown forces going inside. So, this was. In this, we use the latent force approach and come up with a smoothing to actually estimate those forces, like deeply buried inside the nonlinear system. And uh, so <coughs> we, were, we managed to like uh, capture the like periodicity of the of the residual over here. So it was quite good prediction, better prediction than without using the latent force. And then, okay, this is a space-time system, just uh, like a space-time creaking kind of application. So you actually have a time and this kind of spatial thing which changing time. So this was using the common filtering smoother approach to estimate the, well, to creak, or how do you say if you <laughs> use that verb? No, I find it easy to say expensive quadratic, but I can't say creature. Creaking. <laughs> And the G was the K, Krike. Krike. Okay. But uh, how do you turn that into a verb? So you like uh, do creaking. Creaking, isn't it? Creaking? The verb creaking. Well, but, but, uh, no, but you, how do you say I? I cringed. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? I cringed this data. But you're not English, but I am not English. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I fitted Gaussian process regression, but I agree, I cringed this data. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, another interesting application which is related to our biomedical engineering laboratory is actually brain imaging. So, also in brain, there are like a space-time processes. Actually, this is cardiac, which you can, it's just a spatial structure and it fluctuates. So, in this case, we used this kind of space-time oscillator, and this is Gaussian process inside there. So it's like part of the equation model. And even though it looks quite ugly, you can st it still fits the framework, and you can use the comma filtering solution for that. Yes. In summary. Let's see what I have. So, okay, the Bayesian filtering and smoothing are related to well recursive estimation of something. So you recursively process the measurements, and then you add the dynamics inside there and you still get the closed form solution or basin solution. And in continuous discrete filtering you have a continuous process and you have discrete measurements. And so GP regression problems can sometimes be recasted as as a state space model where there's a continuous thing going on and you measure at discrete time instances. And then you can well do all kinds of things with that and then you can generalize that to infinite dimensions, for example, so you get space-time processes. And you can put them inside latent force models to get the state-based latent force models. And use common filters to do estimation in them, and slightly over time. But so this is an advertisement for sure, but this is free. So there's PDF version on my webpage, so it's not an advertisement. You don't need to buy it. So the first part of my presentation is really from this. And the second part is uh, mainly based on this slightly popularized article. Of course, there are, there's a line of conference articles which are slightly harder to read, but the details are there. And then some other references. I, I wanted to put this Jatsvinsky's book, because actually the, <laughs> the whole continuous discrete filtering and smoothing thing is in that book already. The Bayesian thing, really. And uh, then the other ones are more like uh, personal references. Okay, Rasmussen Williams is there. But anyway, I just want to point out that if you want the extensions, it, you can actually find many of them already here. Okay, but thank you for listening.
I want to doubly advertise Simo's book. Uh, I think it's an excellent. Uh, it's difficult trying to wade through the Carmen filter literature to see everything that's there, and Simo puts it all together in a form that I think, certainly for machine learning people, is very coherent and very easy to understand. And you'd think the book was sort of that thick, given the rest of the literature, but it's not. It's nice and easy to carry. So uh, <laughs> I would buy it rather than just read it online. Anyway, questions? <coughs> Uh, yes. I wonder, is there any way to, like, uh, if I have a uh, non stationary kernel, like a purity kernel, uh, we cannot build this <coughs> spectacular spectacular and cannot get the SD. So, so is there some way to <coughs> not build this purity kernel? Well, for the periodic ones, there I it can be represented in state space form. So we are, well, I, I don't know how sort of article. Well, we will have hopefully in AS stats because it's a review right now. But it, it's possible to convert periodic coherence functions into state space form. Because you have a, like the latent stationary thing there. But if you want to be more general, there is an ancient article by Anderson and Moore in from seventies. I'm still trying to read it so that I can implement it. But there exist all kinds of things in that control theory side. So what you can so they have actually partial dissolved. So you can, in principle, convert any covariance function, a temporal covariance function, into state space form. But I don't know how well they are. So you need to read them. I, I can point them, <laughs> point out them, but they're quite complicated procedures. I haven't implemented those. Another question, Rich. Sorry, I tried uh, um, coding myself for the uh, just a temporal Gaussian process. And it works beautifully, uh, amazingly. Uh, and I wanted it for the spatial temporal uh, case, but the, the, the infinite dimensional common filter just sounds so forbiddingly difficult and opposing, you know, the PDE approaches. Is it as bad as it sounds, or is there software out there we can use? I mean, Well, we are working on building a software toolbox out of those. So that's, I was going to add uh, another line, a couple of lines here, so about the toolboxes, because in the previous presentation there was, but I, I just ran out of time and then my computer didn't work, so it's, it's <laughs> well, computer works, but the video thing doesn't. So there are, there is toolbox about this filtering and smoothing methods, so EKF, UKF toolbox, which is from, based on my own PhD thesis, and we are currently building a toolbox which contains those sta state space methods. It's a MATLAB toolbox, it contains some space-time things as well. But uh, the space-time thing is really something like ongoing research right now. So we need to finish the research first and then we can publish the code. <laughs> Part of the audit. And we're actively persuading them to implement it in GPI. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, Ar 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 Arno Sully, who is actually responsible of the MATLAB code also, well, he was here and was implementing part of those two. The, the problem with both those answers is it didn't include the word R. Right. <laughs> Rich, you can uh, come on board and help implement well, this. I'm asking, is it difficult <laughs> to do this? Uh, you know, how hard is this implementation coming filter? To, how, how involved is it? Is it? So y you need to implement the PD method yourself. Yeah. So that was the like a reason why we didn't publish this like five years ago because we need to figure out how to. So the PD is from the scratch, so that you can go by the Kalama folder with the PD is over. So, so five years worth of hard. But <laughs> we have documented how, what we ended up. So no. so it's already solved, but <laughs> it was a long process to actually. Yeah. So it, it was hard, but now now we know how to do it, so yeah. we can actually share the information. But once uh, once uh, it's implemented, that we'll be able to work out how to solve the PDE with the Gaussian process approach, <laughs> and by bootstrapping, it will just uh <laughs> yes. <yeah>, so <laughs> except that there's a PDE solver inside that. <laughs> yeah, well that could be based on GPs. <laughs> so, so maybe you could cut the circle. It's interesting. You, you said that you take your uh, spectral density of any kernel that you're interested in, and if it's not rational, then you might approximate it with hard A or something like that. Have you got any feel for how sensitive it might be when you make that approximation? It seems to me going from something that is <coughs> irrational or yeah, you're not a rational polynomial to a rational polynomial might reflect itself in a very different kind of final covariance structure. 
Well, it's, it depends. So if you use uh, like a squared, not squared, exponent, <laughs> quadratic covariance function, so, so, so it looks like a Gaussian yeah. shape. And uh, you can form an approximation, like a like fifth order approximation, which when you plot it, you can see that it's slightly.